yesterday in Belgium, Vanessa, there was a case involving Belgium, Luxembourg, and Skype. Can you give us a bit of background on that? Well, I haven't read the judgment yet, uh, but it is indeed a very interesting case. Uh, what was the case about? It was actually about just you know, a couple of suspects that were using Skype, like many of us are doing, to communicate. And uh, a Belgian investigating judge was very much interested in knowing where they were at the time of their communication and also what the content of their communication was. Only Skype is based in Luxembourg and not in Belgium. And uh, instead of passing, you know, using the international or the European framework that is there, um, the Belgian Euro investigating judge just sent an email basically to Skype saying, well, can you give us this information? Uh, so both content and uh, data and traffic localization uh, data of, uh, of the suspects. And Skype refused. And then it was Skype uh, that was prosecuted, uh, criminally prosecuted, for not cooperating. And yesterday's judgment, indeed, is the Court of Appeals of Antwerp's judgment in this case, uh, which confirmed a, f a prior first instance, Court of First Instance uh, judgment, saying that Skype should have cooperated. Now, there were a number of interesting arguments in this case. For instance, one of the arguments was, uh, of Skype's arguments, was, well, we technically weren't capable of, 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 of wiretapping because it's peer-to-peer. -peer. So we cannot, we have no access to, to the content, for instance. Another argument was, well, if we give you that data, even if we were able to do so, then we would be violating Luxembourg legislation, uh, privacy legislation, because we cannot give that information to foreign authorities. In, first, in the first instance, or at the first instance level, uh, the court of Mechelen, uh, not that far from here, just dismissed all those arguments, uh, saying, well, technically, you simply have to be capable to wiretap everything. If you're not capable, then you have to redesign your services or your software. And when it comes to EU or other uh, national legislation, apart from Belgian legislation, we're not interested. You have to comply. You're offering services here in Belgium. We can go to the website of Skype, download the software, use it here in our own language. And so you're here, and you have to comply with our rules, which is a very interesting perspective, of course, because if you, if you copy-paste this uh, to other situations, then you will get loads of conflicts. John, this goes to, to really the heart of the matter, the conflict of laws. Uh, what you're asked to do in one jurisdiction and what you're obliged to do in another is at variance with itself. How does this get resolved? Well, as a service provider, we're, just a little context, we're at the beginning of this new era of computing we call cloud computing, where increasingly, instead of data running in data centers like the little server room over there, they're, they're run in large-scale data centers um, where services are run at, 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 you know, at hyperscale. And, and so we find ourselves no longer, we're not selling software, we're running services and, and we have customers data in our data centers. And that it's, it's customer data centers of individuals, um, you know, so the people in the Mechelen case or uh, in other cases, but it's also the confidential documents of governments uh, and enterprise customers uh, of all size. And so we hold a great deal of very confidential, important information in our data centers. Mm -hmm. and, and so we're very interested in creating a framework that, that works for law enforcement, but most importantly works for our customers. Because our customers need to know that if they entrust their data with us, what their legal rights will be, and that they're not gonna lose rights to have privacy protection and due process because they move to a cloud service. But this is market-driven to some degree as well. So if you can provide a safe enough service by their, the client's estimation, they're going to go to someone else and they're going to uh, move to a different market perhaps as well. well how, do you see, uh, how do you see this affecting the business model? Well, the, the danger of, of sort of taking this sort of an, an ad hoc decision by decision approach is, is you'll lead to decisions like, well, I guess the only way to comply with, with this kind of court decision is you've got to store that data just within the geographic boundaries of that jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. Because in today's world, that's the only way to do it. And, and so you end up with some areas won't get service because it's just not economically feasible. Um, and 
you know, you'll just, if you have to start ring fencing every geography, it's just, it, it takes away all, you know, all the advantages of scale okay. that customers would benefit from. Catherine, you face uh, two challenges. You've got to fix the internal market, the single market, and you've got to deal with transatlantic partners as well. How, how do you think that's going to work out? Well, that's the million dollar question, right? If I already knew that, um, I'd be a very happy person. <laughs> you seem pretty happy, actually. <laughs> I, um, I, I think you know the, the points that John and Vanessa raise are really uh, the central points. Um, and just to, to put that into perspective, um, the conflict that we see on content, that's really where we see um, the, um, the strongest conflicting obligations that are imposed on the service providers and that basically create a situation that is um, not sustainable for the service providers because they should not be the ones to arbitrate between the laws of different countries. That doesn't work um, for them or for the authorities, in fact. Um, but if you put that into perspective, we actually see, um, in terms of the numbers of requests, so just to give you an idea, we have about 1,300 mutual legal resistance requests coming from the EU to the US a year, which most of which are will be on content data, because that's the data where absolutely uh, authorities have to go through mutual legal assistance. Um, on the other side, we see 120,000 direct requests from law enforcement, from the judiciary in the EU, to just the five biggest service providers in the US. So that's um, 100 times more. Um, and that uh, is only for non-content data. So we see that for many investigations, the key information is actually things like subscriber information, mm -hmm. which is 70% of the direct requests, or access logs. So when did a certain IP address access a given service in the US? And there, I think, we see a totally different level of conflict uh, we have very few cases where that puts providers in a difficult position. And then actually when you get to content, that's where we really have to go and see how can we deal with the conflicting uh, laws of different countries and even see on the, on the interpretation of how far those conflicting laws go. Because at the moment, uh, with the ongoing Microsoft case, this is actually being tested uh, as we speak before the Supreme Court. So how far do these confl conflicting obligations go when it comes to content? And in terms of fixing the digital single market, I mean, I think if we have a framework that works better for everyone, that would be a big step. Uh, we see that cybercrime is a big concern for users. We just had a big survey across the EU where um, nine out of 10 people said that cybercrime was of key importance to them. And we actually see that uh, something like between 12 and 15% of people don't use online banking services, don't shop online because they don't trust uh, the digital single market. And that's not a good story from the economic perspective. So if there's things we can do to better fight cybercrime and at the same time safeguard fundamental rights, that I think would be a good story to sell.